that so hopefully get connected. We good? Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're coming to you from O'Galley First Baptist Church tonight, uh, prayer and Bible study time. And uh, we're just uh, excited to be able to uh, host prayer and Bible study tonight. And of course, we are uh, going to buy a little time here as people start to tune in. And I'm here with Pastor Mark and Mr. Jordan over here. And, and uh, we're going to be going through a uh, continual Bible study in the book of John tonight. Uh, also, we're going to begin, of course, with a prayer request time as well. But I think just as uh, people are tuning in here, uh, I'll throw a couple questions uh, to these guys. Uh, what are some blessings that you have seen during this time? I, I know a lot of us, you know, we, we look at some of the negative going on. People are scared. People are frightened. But what are some of the blessings that you have seen, whether it's in your own life, in the life of your family, or even some of the things that maybe you have heard during this time? Well, my family runs uh, pretty much full blast all the time. So we are involved in competitive sports and different things like that. So we're always on the go 100% of the time. It's basketball training, speed and agility training, basketball practice for this girl, basketball practice for that girl. So... Uh, this has caused us to slow down and actually be able to get the fishing poles out and we go out to the river and drown some shrimp and, you know, we're able to catch some fish and just have fun together as a family. And uh, that kind of family time was at a premium before now, you know, so we've really enjoyed that, uh, connecting more as a family and, and having more time to do fun things like that. Uh, yeah, I'd say, and I, I hate to... It sounds a little bit like tooting my own horn, but I remember, uh, what is it, Second Perry 4-4 says, <laughs> he who doesn't toot his own horn shall not have his horn tooted. So I'll say that um, my family really, you know, personally has enjoyed the activities and the videos that we've been putting out. Briar's favorite new show is the, the preschool ministry video. That thing plays on loop at my house. That's awesome. So I don't know, Ollie's become her new best friend. But it's, it's been really cool because working at the church with all the kids all the time, you don't always get to just focus on your family and to, to watch them grow and then work through it. I agree. I mean, going through, you know, the last several weeks, I've got a couple teenagers at home. One of them's about to graduate, and, and you know, we're, we're going through this together. But uh, just thinking about... Um, this time that we have together and kind of what a blessing it is because uh, in a few months, you know, Noah's going to be, you know, moving away. And so, uh, you know, God, you know, in his providence has, has given us that uh, extra time with our son. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of being able to, good to help the kids with school. Um, but I, I think the spiritual aspect of it, it's an important thing that we can't uh, you know, just uh, we, we can't forget the, the fact that we have more time to um, especially, I mean, you know, I, I've seen you doing a, a fantastic job of that. Uh, you know, you, typically on Sundays when Jordan is helping us uh, with the uh, broadcast on Sunday mornings or worship service, uh, he gets out of here very quickly because him and his kids are going through the kids ministry stuff yeah. like immediately um, after uh, it's broadcasted uh, after the church service. So it's a pretty cool thing. Um, it's been good to stay connected with some of our youth uh, through uh, Zoom meetings and, and other things. But uh, you, you, you always have to look for that silver lining. And, and I, I know it's really tough on a lot of people right now. Um, but, you know, my, my prayer is that you do find some kind of blessing uh, during this time. And don't be afraid to share that blessing. I think people need a lot of encouragement during this as well. Um, you know, speaking of, we're going to uh, move into a time of prayer request and really want to encourage everybody, if you would, uh, as you are tuning in, go ahead and shoot us your prayer request uh, via, uh, you know, uh, uh, the live broadcast, and, and we're reading, we're watching, we're seeing uh, several of you guys tuning in right now, and thank you so much for tuning in. But uh, we continue to grab a prayer list. Um, if you have not joined the online prayer chain, uh, just go ahead and email Pastor Ralph at rnigard at egfirst.org, and uh, he'll resend you an invite. And a lot of people are praying for each other on it. It's a really cool thing to see. Um, but we, we get prayer requests requests there. People call things in. Um, so there, there's a lot of things going on. So um, just looking ahead to, you know, this week and looking at our prayer requests, is there anything before we dive into these that um, you guys want to add to our prayer requests that things maybe you've heard today or during this week? I would say that I definitely, at least it's on my heart, 
that you just pray for your church and really for everybody, not just the church, but everybody as we start to figure out what what phase one looks like, what what reentering society and all of that, what that really comes to is we all just try to find our way through it, that we stay close to God and figure out the way that he wants us to do that. I think one of the things that came to my attention this week was that, you know, with school being out, uh, a lot of people don't think about this, but a lot of kids, like when they go to school, that is their safe place because things aren't good at home. And I think it's important to remember, you know, those kids who are at risk, who are forced to be home in situations that aren't good right now. And let's just remember them in prayer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, thinking about the, you know, the school issues and uh, some of y'all have probably been listening to Governor DeSantis uh, this afternoon talking about phase one, reopening things slowly and everything. And of course, uh, like Jordan said, pray for us as a church as we try to navigate those waters as well. Uh, we, of course, don't want to put anyone at risk for anything. We want to play it safe. Um, at the same time, we know that people need a personal touch as well. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that are hurting. That just They, they need um, companionship. They need you know people to come alongside them. They need, uh, whether it's you know their Sunday school leaders or uh, pastors or whoever it is to, to be there right uh, there beside them as they go through this. Um, you know, speaking of schools, you know, school's going to be winding up here in a month and we've got, you know, the, this, this huge class of seniors across the county that are going to be graduating and across the country, honestly. And a lot of them are just, you know, they're, they're, they're missing out on a lot of things right now and stuff. So, um, Mark, would you, uh, please pray for our schools, our teachers, administrative, uh, the students. And like you said, you know, th those kids who school was a safe place for them. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight, Lord, lifting up uh, the situation with the schools. Um, God, we just especially feel for our seniors who are missing out on you know, half of their senior year. And Lord, we pray that you would just bring other blessings to them, Lord, so that when they look back on this time, they won't look back as seeing it as a disappointment, but seeing it as a, a time when they were able to really enjoy their family and other things. And God, at the same time, we know that there are kids out there who um, school is their safe place and where they're living in difficult situations. And I pray for your blessings on them. And God, there are, there are kids that have come to my mind right now that are in difficult situations and Lord, now they're not getting a break from it. And I pray for your protection on those kids, for your strength, for your comfort, and that Lord, through this situation that you would bring grace to them and Lord, help them to find or the help that they need through this difficult time. Lord, bless our teachers as they have to adjust to teaching online and or especially bless the students and the parents as they try to adjust to going to school online. God, we thank you that there's an internet and resources that can help uh, make this happen, make it a reality. And Lord, I just pray that you would help uh, everyone to come to an understanding of how to fulfill their role. And God, I pray that kids would not miss out on their education this year, but that Lord, they would be ready at the end of this year that they would be all prepared for next year. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we are looking through the uh, prayer request, um, you guys keep an eye on, on yeah. the ones that are coming through here. Um, I'm going to be uh, uh, kind of catching you up on some of the ones that have come across our prayer chain here. And so um, we got prayers for uh, Hal and Dean. Uh, I, I think that probably should say, I'm not, say Diane maybe. Pray for Diane's parents who are in an assisted living facility in Vieira. Um, so this is um, this has come from actually Pastor Ralph, and um, he, he just asked continual prayer for his in-laws. Um, they've been up there in Vieira, and um, there's some uh, things going on there. And so just continue to pray for uh, his mother-in-law, pray for Diane and Ralph um, as they continue to try to minister to uh, uh, her parents and everything that they're going through right now. Um, also, Michelle Phillips is asking prayer for a young lady who uh, we prayed for last week who went missing. Um, fortunately, she was found safe. She returned home. Um, so not going into the very details of everything there, but there's just, uh, it's, it's a, a tough situation. And so we just ask that um, for the, the family of Mariah, um, that people will just continue to be in prayer for this young lady and her family uh, while things are going on. Uh, we have a uh, pray. Uh, let's see, 
prayer for Mike Bowers. This is uh, Michelle Phillips' uh, boss. Um, he's only been able to go to the ER for his diagnosis and treatment. It's a concern because every doctor he's seen has diagnosed him with something different. Uh, he does have an appointment coming up to have an MRI at the VA, so we continue to pray for Mike. Um, coming from uh, our secretary, uh, Liz, um, her best friend, Marsha, um, her mother, Sandy, is a diabetic and had foot surgery on the 28th. So pray for continued healing and pray that she does not uh, contract, obviously, any kind of virus, COVID-19, uh, while she's in the hospital. Um, Praying for comfort for the McCalla family. Um, uh, Pastor Ralph had sent us this earlier today um, that he found out that their 23-year-old grandson of, of, of Barbara uh, passed away suddenly. His name was Jaron. Uh, he apparently had issues with high blood pressure and a heart murmur. So please continue to pray for the McCalla family. Uh, pray for comfort for the Woods family. Um, uh, some of y'all might have heard uh, one of our longtime members, Evelyn Woods, passed away. And uh, her grade side service uh, will be on Tuesday, which is next Tuesday, correct? I believe yeah. yeah. Um, so she was 94 and a half years young. Uh, only 10 people, uh, oh no, it was this Tuesday because he said only 10 people could attend, um, which is, of course, the social distancing thing. But uh, just continue to pray for her Sunday school class. She was part of the Redeemed Ladies class. And, uh, you know, Evelyn had been around for a long time. And, um, you know, one of our, our senior saints. Uh, pray for the uh, Harrell family, coming from Pastor Ralph. Violet Harrell's oldest and remaining sister passed away last weekend in Michigan. So please pray for her and for Jimmy and their grief. Um, we have a praise here. Uh, daughter Jen received a long-awaited kidney transplant uh, this past Saturday afternoon. Uh, God is truly amazing, so we rejoice in, in that kidney transplant. Uh, coming from uh, Martha Quintana, uh, prayers for cousin Carlos. Um, She's praying that everyone is good and safe. Uh, pray for Carlos. He's been hospitalized and they need to run the test for COVID-19. However, his kidneys and bladder are in bad shape and now they found water in his lungs. Uh, he has a little girl of five years uh, old and uh, let's see, his sister, my cousin Patty, has a 16-year-old girl uh, that sees him as a father figure. So pray for wisdom for the doctors, but please pray for salvation and uh, their parents, uh, aunt and uncle um, as well. So uh, there's, there's several things there. Um, got one over the phone a little while ago. Um, this is uh, coming from Richard Court. Um, update on uh, Diane after coming home last Thursday. Uh, she started having headaches again, and the doctor came, uh, had her come back to the hospital for another C CT scan on Monday. They haven't heard any news yet, um, but they are giving her a couple medications that are helping a little bit, so continue to pray for the courts. And what else is coming, Jordan? Um, Morgan Shadow is having surgery tomorrow. That's right. So we definitely want to keep her in prayer and, and the doctors, obviously. Okay. And uh, it praises uh, Patty. Patty's surgery went well yesterday. Patty Wallace. And, yes. Uh, she's doing good. Excellent. Um, Jordan, can you lift up these requests? Yeah. Thanks. God, we just want to come again to you tonight and. All, all these people we've mentioned and, and those that we know that we haven't mentioned, God, we just want to lift them up to you, want to put them in your hands and pray that that you extend your hands of healing or your hands of comfort onto these situations, God, that through who, through those who have experienced loss, you can, you can just demonstrate your love and your tender care. And through those who right now are, are suffering through medical problems, that, that your hands of healing can come out. God, we just pray that through all of this, these people can, can rest in your hands and that you can demonstrate your might and your power through these, these awful situations. Um, God, we just want to pray that you, you glorify yourself through all of these things that are happening and through all these things that we've lifted up to you and through all the, all the other concerns that we know are, are pressing on everybody who's watching and listening tonight, every member of this church, every member of every community, really. Um, we just pray that you continue to to glorify yourself continue to let yourself be known um even in the midst of this trouble we love you and we thank you amen amen you know speaking of you know some of the the praises um you know we had a couple praises come in but um you know, we, we, we've got a couple um, little babies on their way pretty soon. And, of course, uh, we continue to uh, pray for uh, uh, Nate and Deborah James, um, you know, just probably any day now. Um, uh, Jacob Payne um, and his wife and, uh, of course, uh, you know, grandparents are eager, you know, for that baby to be born as well. So we continue to pray for uh, these new 
children entering the world during this time. Um, but but think about the, you know some of the the other things, and this is kind of a challenge to everyone who is watching tonight. Uh, we would love to to know how God is working in your life during this time. Uh, it's one of those things that you know we don't get to hear a lot of it. Um, because we're, we're not seeing people face-to-face -face nearly as much. But if you want to shout a praise out um, to, to God for something that he's doing in your life or something that you've seen or just a way that God's speaking to you through that, um, let it be an encouragement, uh, you know, a benefit to the entire church as we're kind of scrolling through these things, reading these things. And I think to me, I know that would be an encouragement because a lot of times we don't get to hear a lot of stuff that's going on. You know, Jordan, he's, he's working with the kids' ministry. And if you're a parent out there, um, pay attention. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff that he's been putting out during this time. And if this is your first time hearing about that, it's okay. Now's the time to catch up. Um, you know, our student ministry, uh, we, we have kept on keeping on. Uh, we, we meet 8 o'clock right after this uh, on Zoom. So there's a lot of things that uh, we're trying to keep our youth connected as well. Um, Mark, Tim, they, they've been still, you know, using their music teams um, to put out what you're seeing on Sunday mornings. And so pray for wisdom for them, you know, as they get these groups together. And, you know, they, they want to bring about God honoring music and worship every Sunday that uh, not only do we get to enjoy, but we get to worship alongside of them, uh, our loving God. So um, let's go ahead and just, uh, I, I like to pray for salvation during this time. Just simple as that, that um, even when, you know, before doors open again, that God would just continue to bring people to himself. Yeah. Uh, God, we just come to, before you now, and, and first of all, we're just thankful that we can do this, um, that we can uh, gather as the church online, and, and God, we just want you to be glorified through everything that, that we say, everything that we do. Um, as we open up your word tonight, uh, let it not be just our opinions or our words, but let your uh, word just speak to, to the folks that are listening. Uh, God, I, I want to pray for just an outpouring of your spirit on this nation, upon this world right now. Uh, God, that when we look back years from now at this time in history, that we will see this almost as a great awakening, uh, that a revival that came across this land, something that you used to wake us all up. And, and God, I just would ask that uh, you would draw people to yourself right now, that people that are hearing the gospel for the first time from churches who are doing podcasts, from churches that are uh, putting uh, their, their messages on videos and, and Sunday services, Wednesday night Bible studies, just all of these many things, God. Uh, I, you know, I can't think of a time that the gospel has been uh, more loudly proclaimed across social media. So we do thank you for that, God, and you can use it to bring glory to yourself. God, I just ask that, and when even when the doors open, Lord, that uh, just an outpouring of people who want to gather together as a church, true disciples would uh, rise among uh, from all of this and, and be able to go out, proclaim your word, and continue to bring in a harvest again to bring you honor. We love you, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're going to jump into John uh, chapter 6, and uh, it's going to be a little bit of a recap as we go into this, all right? So Yeah, and of course, guys, as we get into the Bible study, kind of part of the evening, make sure you, if you've got a prayer request, feel free to continue to send that in. We do go back and look at these things. Absolutely. Uh, so we're actually jumping in, let's see, around verse 59, but we're going to back up a little bit because one of the very first things that uh, we're going to see in this passage here is it's a response to this massive just... I mean, it's just this teaching that Jesus gave, and I think we have to comprehend that. So if you missed it last week, uh, cool, we're going to catch you up. If you were here last week, uh, bear with us. You probably already heard some of this before, but for the context of what we're going to be talking about tonight, we've got to back up a little bit. So, uh, Mark, would you jump in at verse 26 and recap us real quick? I say real quick. It's a lot of verses. <laughs> Jesus answered, I assure you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform the works of God, they ask. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. What sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you? They asked, what are you going to perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I assure you, 
Moses didn't give the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the real bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me, and yet you don't believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Therefore the Jews started complaining about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Stop complaining among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone who has seen the Father, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. I assure you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give you for the life of the world is my flesh. At that, the Jews argued among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I in him. Just as the Father, just as the living Father sent me, and I will live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your fathers ate, and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. That's good. That's good. Whew. That was a mouthful. <laughs> There's, you know, several things just kind of recapping um, what is happening here, you know, as Jesus is is giving these words to the people, I think there's a, a commonality that is happening, a common theme that we see, um, you know, some of the, I like to like key in on keywords, right, and, you know, circle those, kind of go through those, and a couple of the keywords, you know, you come across is bread, you know, we see bread a lot, um, you see the word believe, and we talked a little bit about like what it meant to believe. Um, it wasn't just something that um, we could say, I know about this Jesus, or I even understand about this Jesus. It's not the same as actually believing, because when we believe in something, we follow through with our whole hearts, with our actions. We're going to go 100% into it. Um, and, and so what, what are the things that stood out to you guys um, as Jesus is speaking here before we get into the meat of the passage that we're about to dive into? I'd, I would say the first thing is, you know, right alongside with you talking about, you know, the difference between, between sort of agreeing with something and actually believing it. And that, I, I feel like that's the line that Jesus is drawing right here. As we'll see, you know, in the following, just a few verses later, that's the line that he's drawing is, all right, if you're, if you're really my disciple, come on, let's go. And if you're not, well, then quit, quit wasting both our time. Yeah. What did you see, Mark? I think Jesus, uh, he, he liked to set the bar high, right, when it came to discipleship. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the bar is belief. But he wanted to make sure that there was no bones about it, yeah. that people didn't think that, well, yeah, okay, I can hang out with you and I'll get eternal life just because I'm around you, kind of like growing up in a Christian family, right. that kind of thing that 
each person's belief needs to be personal, right? It's not a blanket belief. I can't believe for you. You can't believe for me. And I think Jesus was, he was wanting to make sure that there was no misunderstanding about the fact that, okay, this is hard. It's controversial that uh, people are going to have an issue with you because they have an issue with me. And I think that's the biggest thing is he, he wanted to make sure they knew the bars here. Yeah. And I, I love that to the answer, and I wasn't here last week, so I didn't get to talk about any of this stuff, but that to the answer of what are the works, what do we have to do, what's the bar that you've said, how many works do we need to, to perform to be doing the work of God? And Jesus said, look, the work of God is to believe the one he sent. Like, there's no, that, that's bottom line. If you believe the one he sent, well, that's it. Congratulations, you did it. Other than that, none of that stuff matters. And think about, you know, these people, you know, that a lot of them have shown up for the show. Yeah. You know, I mean, when we go all the way back to verse two, you know, what is it like the miracles? Remember, it's just like, it's all about, you know, the miracles, man, I'm going to follow this guy because you see all these miracles. And then, of course, he feeds their bellies. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. We're Baptist, right? Uh, we like to I mean, fed. we like to feed bellies, yeah. you know, potluck lunches, uh, uh, you know, whatever it is, ice cream socials, um, our senior adult luncheons, you know. Food. Uh, food. Food gets people here, right? And Amen. so they were they were excited. It's like, oh, this guy feeds our bellies. He's performing miracles. Um, let's see. He's taught you, you know, he he's got us on this thing about political freedom, power, you know, that the things that they are thinking about. And you know, one of the other things that when they're looking for someone to lead them into the future, of course. They're looking for a warrior, someone who's going to overthrow Rome, yeah. someone who, who they can, you know, take them to battle and lead the charge and do the hard work. And I love what Mark said was talking about, like, hey, it's hard. You know, this stuff is going to be hard. And as we go into the last part of this chapter, we're going to see how hard it gets. And Jesus doesn't pull any, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's kind of rough. I, uh, he's he's <laughs> definitely, especially when you understand the culture. Yeah. I mean, Jesus is absolutely weeding out the people who are not there for the right reasons. You know, he, he draws the line in the sand that, yeah. that they can't cross unless they're true believers. Right, and I mean, let's face it. Like, how many people across America today, I'm just going to jump out there and say it, how many people across America today go to church because of the show, right? Uh, yeah. They yeah. pick the church with the best show, and they go there because it's easy. I can go there. I can slip in and slip out. Nobody knows me. I'm not connected. I don't have to use my spiritual gifts. I don't have to follow through, right? And these people were like that. They were, they were coming out to the show. They were like, hey, this is the best show in town, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. This is the greatest show, and we're going to tag along until this thing burns out. And they were there for the show. You're right. They weren't there for the right reasons. Yeah, and, you know, it, like it's I, I, this conversation is always tough for me because – as somebody who, who puts together parts of a, a teaching lesson, a ministry at the church for Sundays, I feel like I devote so much energy, and I know you guys feel it too because we've talked about this, so much energy into perfecting that, that one hour, that 30 minutes, into making that right and polishing that up and making sure that nothing's going wrong and that everybody knows where they're supposed to be and that it just runs smoothly. And in the end, that's not really ministry, or that's just the smallest piece of it. Um, I think what's really cool about what Jesus does here, which we keep talking about it, we haven't actually gotten to where he's done it. <laughs> Getting there. Yeah. <laughs> but what's really cool about what he does here is that the same show that brought them there is still there. Jesus still continues to heal. He still continues to preach. He continues to do all the same things he was doing, but his message doesn't change. He's going to speak the truth whether you like it or not. Yeah. You can be there for the truth, but if you're there for any other reason, well, then just get offended and go away. Which we'll see in a second. <laughs> it's kind of what happens. Um, have you guys ever taken a, what, what, I guess what they call a weed out class? You know, whether it was in, I know you went to like Bible college. Um, you know, I, it's like when I went to, to, to Florida State, um, one of the very first classes I ever took was what you call a weed out class, right? So I, I thought it was going to be a criminology major. Mm -hmm. And I got there, and so the entire class was nothing but lecture and three tests. That was it. I mean, there was nothing else. And so as a freshman in college, 
I found out that I got to sleep in. And I didn't go to that class very often because attendance wasn't taken. And so three hardest tests <laughs> in the history of Earth. Yeah. Of course, it does help if you take notes in class, which you have to be there. You to have that. to be there. And I remember I, I slid by with a passing grade, barely slid by. But let me tell you, that weeded me out. Yeah. of ever being a criminology major. I mean, <laughs> it did its job, you know, and, and I kind of see that here with what is about to happen, that, you know, this has been a weed out class, you know, and, and Jesus is about to bring uh, the non-passing grades about to many people yeah, yeah. and stuff. So uh, let's jump in in uh, verse 59 here. Um, these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? Now, just stopping right there. Many of his disciples. Okay, now are we talking about just the 12? What are we talking about here? We're talking about all the people following him. <laughs> uh, these are the ones who have gone town to town to town, listened to Jesus preach. They've seen him do the miracles. They've got to, at least at some level, be thinking, hey, this guy just might be the guy. These are the ones that we're talking about who say, that's a really tough teaching you just said there. <laughs> and like the, you, first you said, this is the work that, this is the work of God, is to believe the one he sends. And the, the Jews said, well, prove it. <laughs> Which I, I'm sure Jesus is like, I'm trying. Um, but Jesus' response is basically, eat me. <laughs> like it's, it, it's. He's bread. It, yeah, exactly. It, it's hard for us to really understand how deeply they would have felt that as Jews. Yeah. You know, I, don't get me wrong. I know most of you listening are not cannibals. And so when somebody tells you to eat them, it's, it's already kind of like, that's weird. But for them, everything about what they ate and, and how they lived was built around the idea of staying ritually clean. And so to eat anything, even with the blood in it, meat that you were allowed to have that has not been cooked fully is, would make you unclean, yeah. would make you unfit to worship at the temple. To eat any food that was not on the approved food list, the, this, and the, the list was given by God, not by, not by the Pharisees. This was a real, uh, a real religious thing yes. that would make you unfit to worship in the temple. And so... When Jesus says this, when the Messiah, they're all following him thinking, this guy just might be the Messiah, the Savior we've been waiting on. And he stood up and said, hey, guys, you want a manna? I got your manna right here. It, it would hit them even harder than it hits us. But they're thinking so literally. You know, I mean, they, they are. They're, they're thinking so literally. And when I hear that statement, you know, when they say this is a difficult statement, who can listen to it? It's kind of like the, whoa, you're crazy. Yeah. You know, like, seriously, <laughs> so, listen to this guy. What were you going to say, Mark? I was just going to say, and, you know, if you think about it for a minute, like, where in the prophets does it say when Messiah comes, he'll say, hey, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, <laughs> like, you can't have eternal life. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like there was really any precedent for them. So this, this was, like you said, it was a very, very shocking statement yeah, and for I Jesus think, oh, to say sorry. that. And, but, but I think that, you know, if you pay attention through Jesus' ministry, like he liked to do that. You know, he liked to drop those bombs to get people's attention, to say, hey, listen, I know you think this is easy. I know you think that, like, you, you're going to get some crumbs just because you're following me around. But here's the deal. There's a line, right? I'm going to draw it right now. And if you want to believe, if you want to follow me, step across that line. Yeah. And if you don't, hit the road. Yeah, that's Jesus. Count up the cost. Like okay, he said that. Don't follow me. Like, count up the cost. <laughs> count what it's going to cost you. And then decide if you want to follow me. Weigh it out. If I'm worth more, then follow me. If not, it was nice to meet you. Well, and that cost is about to get very apparent here. Um, we see in verse 61, but Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, says to them, does this cause you to stumble? And, and I love this statement here because he's, he's, it's kind of like giving people an out, you yeah. know? It's like, hey, this stuff causes you to stumble. There's the door. Yeah. I mean, again, a tough thing. It's, he's, 
You know, Jesus obviously is kind and loving and everything, but he knows the hearts of these people. Mm -hmm. He knows exactly why they're following him around. And so, I mean, he just lays it out, shows them the door here and says, hey, does this bother you? Uh, Does this cause you to stumble? Um, And then he goes on 62. What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Um, What do you make of that passage there? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? If this blows your mind... Wait till I raise from the dead. You see me take off like a rocket. Like, if you think that this is mind-boggling, you haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. Like, we, we haven't even really uh, turned on the gas, so to speak. And if this is shocking to you, then the rest of the road is probably going to be too much. Yeah. A couple of the things that you see in that one little verse, this verse is loaded here when he says, what then if you see the Son of Man? Of course, you know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when referring to himself as the Son of Man, we look back at the Old Testament, uh, we know, you know, the Son of Man, this is referred to as God here, right? So, of course, he's bringing, you know, so like, hey, listen, I'm God, and ascending to where he was before. Let, let's, I mean, you know, you dig a little into that, where are we talking about? I mean, we go back to John 1, 1, you yeah. know? He was there in the very beginning when creation was happening, he was there, and so like Mark said, uh, you haven't seen anything yet, so when I, you know, uh, do my Superman thing, and you know, I put my fist in the air, and I fly up through the clouds. Uh, you guys are going to be blown away. Yeah, like yeah. You, you, you're not going to believe it, you know. And um, in verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who it was that would betray him. So I. Two things there. The first is, is kind of the second thing. How crazy is it that Jesus knew who it was that was going to betray them? I, like, it, it says it again a few verses later, and I just scribbled in my Bible, did Judas know at this point? Like, did Jesus know that Judas would betray him before it was even a thought in Judas's head? Like, that's, I don't know, that, that's just kind of an interesting road to go down. But the, the, the real thing that I wanted to point out is what Jesus talks about there as far as spiritual things goes. You know, he says, I'm speaking to you of spiritual things. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. Um, I think the reason that they take such offense to what Jesus says here when he says, I'm the bread of life. You know, you're, you're bringing up manna. Well, I'm the manna. Congratulations, you found it. Um, what they missed here is just in verse 55, where Jesus says, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true, gin- true drink. Um, the spiritual world is superior to the physical. It doesn't feel like that because we can see the physical, we can feel the physical, we smell it, we taste it. It's, it's all around us. The spiritual is not, not able to be sensed, not by our senses. And so it can feel like one is definitely a counterfeit of the other. Right. Um, and I think that that is what they missed. He said his body was true food. Now, if we believe everything that Jesus says, then his body must be true food. However, Jesus was not truly, not in the literal sense of the word, telling us to eat him. So the spiritual world has to be the more real place. Um, C.S. Lewis, he, he wrote about it, as, he called it the Shadowlands, and how, you know, at the time of death is when, not even in the blink of an eye, it's without blinking, the veil of the physical world is torn away, and suddenly you find yourself standing in the spiritual world where you've always been. You can see the spiritual reality and recognize how much more real it is than the physical reality that we think is so real. Yeah. I think a lot of, you know, I mean, again, you know, I, I think you hit 63 very well there. Um, when we get into verse 64, you know, we're, um, you know, we're talking about some tough things, things that uh, I think a lot of believers sometimes are at odds about and stuff. But, um, you know, without going, you know, too much into anything divisive here, um, one of the things that I think what we see is the sovereignty of God, regardless right? When we look at the sovereignty of God, knowing that, um, you know, of course, we hear the big words that God is omniscient, he's omnipresent, 
Um, he's all knowing. He's all powerful. You know, we, we, we hear those things, right? Do we actually internalize them? Do we believe those things? Real quick, what's yeah. the sovereignty of God, Matt? The sovereignty of God is basically saying that God can do what he wants. Um, you know, I like mean, a king. You, well, he kind of sovereign. Is. Yeah, you know. Gotcha. And stuff. So, um, and, and who are we to argue with him? You know, he is God, and it is only by his grace and his mercy that allows me to have a relationship with him right. and stuff. So when we see that, that there are some of you who do not believe, Jesus knew from the beginning who they were and who would not believe and who it was that would betray him. Uh, you know, I've got to just look at that and say, you know, I can't argue with him. You know, simple as that. I can't argue with my king. You know, he, he knows what he's doing here. Um, and, and so, you know, even thinking about Judas, who would betray him, um, you know, you ask that question. It's kind of a, you know, you ponder. It's like, yeah. there, there's Judas sitting there following him around, doing all these things. Did Judas know yet? Because Judas stays with him after this point. Yes. The rest of the crowd leaves. And Judas, the betrayer, stays and follows Jesus. Yes. I think he was on the fence. I really do. And, you know, a lot of people give Judas a lot of hate because he betrayed Jesus, right? That feels valid. And that does, <laughs> I think that is valid. But a lot of people also say that he didn't have any remorse, but he went back and he tried to return the money, you know, and out of guilt, he hung himself. And that's why I feel like at this point, Judas was probably torn because he probably did believe, but he obviously had an addiction probably to stealing money. And I think Jesus probably already knew this guy's, you know, he's the treasure and he's dipping his hand in the pot. So I, th I think Judas falls kind of in a different category, maybe right in between the people that said, we're out of here. And the people who were saying, Jesus, we're with you no matter what. I, th I think Judas was still in his mind on the fence, but I don't, in Jesus' mind, it, he wasn't on the fence. Yeah, and I, I think the story of Judas, which is not what we're talking about right now, but sort of is, um, I think that that can be tied into the idea of the, the spiritual world and the physical world. And I just, I try to, when I imagine the story of Judas and I think about the part in the story where as soon as he has betrayed Jesus and realized he betrayed him and gone back and they, they won't take the money back, as soon as he realizes he can't take this back, the Bible tells us Satan left him at that moment. And isn't that exactly what happens? Like everybody has had that thing. You, you fall into that sin and it was great and then it was not great. And the moment it's not great and the moment you needed that friend, well, Satan ain't that guy. Satan was like, yeah, man, joke's on you. I'm out. It, it's just amazing to me how, how far down a road you can go. And you can see the road in a hundred million different ways but it's always the same. You'll always follow that path that looks like it's going to be something good. And then Satan always leaves you. The pleasure always leaves. You're always left broken at the end of it. It's a tough one to think about because, I mean, we know how the story of Judas ends. You yeah. know, as yeah. he hangs himself, um, it, it's just not a pretty picture. Um, you know, one of the things, and, you know, this is, you know, throwing this out here, uh, you know, about Judas is, you know, whether, you know, obviously Jesus knows who betrays him and everything. We know that Satan, you know, at the moment after, you know, he, he announces it, Satan enters into Judas, right? And so, you know, is, is Judas an object of wrath, you know, at this point? When we look back at... Um, well, well, I mean, we look back at Pharaoh, you know, and, you know, and I mean, it was Pharaoh hardened his own heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart, you know, back in the Old Testament, the story of Moses and stuff. So, I mean, he obviously, you know, I, I've been, I was reading the book of Job um, this morning. We're doing a James Bible study and we went back to Job. And, you know, I mean, when, when Satan, you know, goes before God and as he's walking to and from, and have you considered my servant Job? Um, you know, after he basically takes everything away from him, then he allows him to attack Job like yeah. you know I mean it, as far as take anything from him do anything you want to except spare his life mm -hmm. you know and so uh, all that it, it's interesting because Satan never once entered him because Job was a righteous man yeah. when we look at Judas though here's a guy who walked around with the Messiah uh, should have been sealed yeah should have been you know and so it, it, it's a tough one to think about yeah. um you know, I mean, especially since it all centers on 
that verse that Jesus just said right there in 60, no. Uh, 64, right. Uh, yes. Oh, 65. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Mm. Like, it, that's what it really centers around. And, and that's a tough one, you know. Um, when we talk about it and we look at Scripture, and, and we're going to get into this, so let me just go ahead and kind of read through this, and then we will um, go back. We're just going to spend a little time on this. Uh, we see in verse uh, 65, and he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew, and they were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Uh, you, you have words of eternal life. You have be- uh, we have believed and you have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Isn't that a little... I don't know, a little light shined into this depressing conversation. <laughs> but that, that Peter is just like, where are we going to go, God? I, where are we going to go, Jesus? You, uh, you're our food. Like it, they're, they're not serving real food anywhere else. You're the only true food in town. In this moment, he gets it. Yeah. In that yeah moment. For a minute. In this moment. For a minute, he gets it. <laughs> and we all feel that too, don't we? If only I could hold on to that moment because I used to have it. It's crazy. Um, you know, backing up to verse 66, when he says, as a result of this, uh, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. I wanted to take a second here and just kind of talk about what this means as far as real and fake. Okay, so uh, when we talk about the real, oh, sorry, <laughs> the real and fake disciples here, um, when he's talking about his disciples, again, this is not the 12, right, because he talks about the 12 here in a second, but when he's talking about uh, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore, this goes back to the people that were there for the show, right? And so uh, I think we've got to talk about, I mean, it's a realistic conversation, is what is a real disciple? You know, what is it? Because this was not, they were not real. Yeah. So what is a real disciple? You're right. It's not follows Jesus. It's not experiences him, at least not, not at that level. It, it has to be something else. Mm-hmm. I think in, in verse uh, 66, I, I really consider this one of the saddest verses of all of Scripture. And ironically, it's chapter 6, verse 66. Yeah, deep, right? Okay. I know, I know. <laughs> so, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. When we talk about what it really means to follow Jesus, I mean, there are tons of good, you know, uh, what, what I call extra biblical books out there, right? Yep. That talk about whether it's missionaries, whether it's um, people who are martyrs, people, you know, I mean, uh, what's his face? Um, uh, oh, boy, German guy. Help me here. Oh, teacher. Thank you. Thank you uh, cost of discipleship, you know. Uh, we talk about him. Um, uh, brother. You? Yes. You know, <laughs> you guys are Just finishing my <laughs> sandwiches. <laughs> sandwiches, yes. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, when we think about some of these guys, we saw Min Kanye um, passed away yesterday. Um, he was one of the guys that, that speared the missionaries to death down in Ecuador. But what a story of redemption yeah. that guy lived through the rest of his life, um, accepting Christ and, and just being a light for the gospel. Uh, it, kind of a cool thing, obviously. But when we count the cost of discipleship, when we think about, you know, what it means to actually follow him. Uh, I, I, I like to write notes here, and I believe this was coming from David Platt, but true disciples make a commitment to follow Jesus. Simple as that. They make a commitment to follow him, and they also make a confession of faith. Mm-hmm. Now, let's think about that confession of faith, because in 68, when Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Rewind. We got to go to Isaiah now, yep. right? We go to Isaiah chapter 6, and guess what we see? Over and over and over again, God is referred to as the Holy One. I mean, it, it, Peter knew it, you know? And going back to this, the Holy One of God is referring to God himself. And so Peter, although he would deny Christ three times, although he was a knucklehead sometimes, what happens here? I mean, once again, he is confessing a confession of faith that the Holy One of God 
is right there with them. Why else would I go away from you? Like you said, you're the bread. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, I mean, this is how I'm getting fed now. Uh -huh. From here on out, this is it. When you think about the mark of a disciple, think about the original 11 and what they endured, what they saw, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ. And people throughout all ages have tried to discredit Christianity. They've tried to say, atheists have said, well, it didn't really happen. Jesus didn't really die, the swoon theory. Um, he was he was revived in the cool of the tomb. Right. And there, there's all these crazy ideas that people have, trying to th have tried to throw out to discredit Christianity. But the one thing, and I think it's, um, so you gotta come up with the name now. Uh, Charles Coulson, um, Chuck Coulson said, hey, think about this. Of the original 11, not one of them ever recanted. Not one of them right. ever said, we made it up. Like a true disciple is one who grabs a hold of and believes and sticks with Jesus until the end. That's what true disciples do. You know, just like none of them, uh, several of them died horrendous deaths. Uh, I think it's tradition that says that Peter was crucified upside down. So burned at the stake, beheaded. Like these guys, they never changed their story because... Their experience with Jesus was so real and so strong. And I think when we're looking at, at true discipleship, I mean, it's somebody who says, Jesus, you are the bread of life. Where else would we go? I mean, what, what better words? You are the one. Yeah. You are the one who has eternal life. There's nowhere else to go for that. Yeah, yeah an absolute confession of faith. Um, uh, you guys remember the book uh, Crazy Love, Francis Chan? Um, found this 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 little uh statement that he made in this and he in the context of what he's talking about is discipleship right um he's talking about you know a lot of people especially in today's cultural christianity you know they want to be saved but they really don't want to follow jesus you know i mean it sounds good right get our you know whether you want to call it our fire insurance card or whatever you know keep me from hell but you know i'm not really going to follow you and a lot of people are doing that and you know many professing believers see a distinction from being um a christian and being a disciple you know it, it, it's yeah. it's kind of a weird thing right um and one of the things he's talking about salvation apart from following jesus is foreign to the bible you know, when we look, and, and this is what he says, though. He says, uh, some people claim that uh, we can be Christian without necessarily becoming disciples. I wonder, then, uh, why the last thing Jesus told us was to go into the world, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that he commanded. You'll notice that he didn't add, but hey, if that's too much to ask, tell them to just become Christians, you know, the people who get to go to heaven without ever having to commit to anything. You know, Dallas Willard said in his book, The Great Omission, he said that for all the differences that evangelicals and non-evangelicals and even within evangelicalism, for all the differences in doctrine and all the differences between one church to another, that all the churches seem to be in agreement on one thing, and that is that discipleship isn't essential for Christianity, or at least that's the message that we seem to give Right? It's not what we believe, but we lower the bar so people can step over it mm. where Jesus raised it and said, if you don't want to step over it, hit the road. Yeah. Ouch, Mark. <laughs> I, I mean, really, ouch, because to take that, that biblical principle and figure out where it applies in my life to ask, what is it that is, is too far for me to follow Jesus? What is a thing I'm not willing to give up to follow Jesus? What is a thing I'm not willing to start doing to follow Jesus? That's, I don't know, that, that's something deep to think about. That's going to take some thought. You know, and let's just say, you know, I mean, let's say the world has changed at this point. You know, a month ago, we probably couldn't have imagined this, you know, as it's coming. So the world has changed. You know, and, and let's just say... So are we imagining this right yeah, now? Yeah, we're imagining okay. this, all right? And uh, we're moving forward, and, you know, the church has to look different from here on out, okay? Uh, we look around into, you know, places like China. Mm -hmm. Underground church, right? They, they figured it out. Um, the church in uh, Africa and Asia is growing exponentially faster than it is here. Yeah, Africa became the fastest-growing Christian nation. Right. 
Uh, it, it, it's it's kind of crazy to see. And, it, of course, these are places where persecution is at its highest, you know. And, of course, you know, we live in land of the free, home of the brave, right? Um, we have this blessing sometimes. And, uh, you know, sometimes that blessing, I think, kind of gets disguised under freedom. If, if you know, I mean, we, we, we look at it and we're like, oh, man, I you know, I love to be free. I love to do all these things. And yet, why is cultural Christianity a thing here? when compared to the people that count the costs in in the places where they could very well get arrested, sent to prison, and die. I mean, why is that? Well, cultural Christianity in America, I think, could go by another name, which is uh, consumer Christianity, right? Where we, we are the land of the free, the home of the brave. We are the land of a million choices. You know, when you go to the grocery store, in other countries, uh, you don't necessarily see 18 billion different types of cereal, right? <laughs> like, I, I know when we were in Taiwan, the grocery store we went to there, the choices were a lot more limited than they are when you go to, say, Walmart Supercenter or to Publix even. That We are a nation of consumers, and we have begun to view the gospel as a product, mm-hmm. Right? And if I like the way that you present the gospel, if I like the way you talk about God, if I like the songs you sing or the band you have, right, and it all comes down to what do I like? And, and what about anything that Jesus ever said about discipleship would give us the idea that it's about what we like? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just, it's not there. Yeah. Um. There, there's an interesting book called God is the Gospel, and um, one of the things that the author is alluding to in God is the Gospel, when he is talking about um, the cost of discipleship and what it looks like, he says, you know, there's this this thing that we have this idea of what heaven is going to be, right? Of course, you know, we see description in Revelation, but so many people who, you know, pick up on, oh, yeah, I accept Jesus, don't want to follow him, but they have this idea of the promised heaven. And, and this is what he's talking about here in the context, but uh, it goes on to say the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven, with no sickness, with all the friends you ever had on earth, and all the food you ever liked, and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed, and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted, and no human conflict or natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven? Yes, and then, if Christ was not there. Ow. And I, and I think the thing, you know, when we look at discipleship is um, when we count the cost, those things, like you were saying, consumer Christianity, worldly Christianity, those are the things that we think of, I think, sometimes, the, the things that, you know, Satan, of course, wants to tempt us with, and yet, if Christ was not in heaven, it would cease to be heaven. And it's so important to remember that. So, you know, as we, you know, finish up this passage here, and we look at, you know, what it means to be a true disciple. Um, you can't do that apart from Christ. Not at all. You can't do that apart from making a confession of faith to Christ. You can't do it apart from, um, you know, making a commitment to follow Christ in your life. I mean, what is the simple thing that he, he asked the disciples? You know, I mean, the, these are guys going about their very, you know, merry way, whether they're fishermen or carpenters or, or whatever they did for a living. Some of them were probably married. Some of them had families, you know. And what is he just, he says, follow me. And they dropped it all. One of the things I think that, all of us here in agreement with is, you know, I mean, we love being part of O'Galley First Baptist Church, but what if, like, you know, half the congregation decided to leave but go out and whether start churches or, you know, foreign missionaries or whatever, is that something we would, you know, be sad about or would we celebrate about? And if we have the bigger vision of what the gospel is supposed to be about, you know, the kingdom church, I think we would celebrate it. You know, the opportunity to uh, equip and raise people up and send them out to every, you know, corner of this globe. Um, you know, Mark and I have had the opportunity to, to go to Ecuador many times. Uh, we'll get Jordan there eventually <laughs> and stuff. So, but um, it, it's a fantastic, you know, um, missions experience to be able to be there hands-on to see what God is doing in the midst of a, a foreign culture um, is an amazing thing. And, you know, that's something that... W- 
you know, one of my, you know, dreams is that every teenager who uh, graduates, you know, before they go off to college, before they go in the military, before they do anything, that they would have that opportunity to go on an international mission trip and see um, the world and see what God is doing around that and stuff. And so. to see their place in it. Absolutely. To, to see how Absolutely. they can be those hands and feet. Absolutely. And how it can actually matter. So. Well, we're um, about out of time here, um, so we're going to be jumping into chapter seven next week, um, and and stuff. So, and if you guys ever have uh, you know questions about some of this stuff, um, feel free to message us. Um, yeah, at, so we at can be time. like, yeah, that's a great question. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I would love to go back and you know the very next week answer a question if somebody had it. Um, absolutely, because you know we don't. I know, make no. Promises. We don't know everything, you know. I mean, that's that's <laughs> obvious. My wife tells me that every day, right? Um, but, you know, we don't know everything, and and you know, I think we're all students. We're all learning, and uh, we just want to be able to do our very best in, with integrity and honesty and truthfulness to uh, lead you into what Scripture says. So, um, Mark, can you finish by uh, closing out in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your Word. We're so grateful. Uh, for the book of John, for the way you preserved it, and what for the words in it, even though they're difficult, they're so instructive. And Lord, we want to be true disciples. We, Lord, we want to be people who uh, live for Jesus, represent Jesus well, who, who really believe that Jesus is the bread of life. And Lord, we want to share that bread with everyone around us. Lord, help us to be faithful to the call that you've given us to make disciples. Lord, help us to be faithful to share Jesus with others, not just during the time of pandemic, but all of the time. God, help us to be your disciples, your church, doing your work on this planet. Lord, I thank you for everyone who's listening tonight or will watch this in the future, and I pray that Lord, your word will just um, plant in them like seeds, God, and the, the desire for discipleship will grow. Lord, we thank you for your love and grace and mercy and for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wait, wait, before you say bye, uh, we probably should say, um, with Mother's Day coming up, yeah, we're hoping to give you guys a chance to honor your mothers. We're trying to put together a video. So go on the church website and just, there's a link to submit a picture of you and your mom, um, and, and we'll try to uh, try to get those all compiled so we can yeah. show it to you on Mother's Day. We put Day. that link on Facebook today, too, awesome. and we also sent it out email. So uh, we got... I think there's like 25 pictures yeah, all awesome, of a sudden. So awesome. we'd love like, you know, 525. It might be a long video, but.